Number 1 The Edison Mall Disappearances On the evening of January 16, 1981, 17-year-old Mary Opitz went to the Edison Mall in Fort Myers, Florida with her mother and brother. During their shopping trip, Opitz told her family that she was tired and wanted to go back to their car, which was parked outside the mall's Woolworth store. She was last seen exiting the mall into the parking lot. Approximately 20 minutes later, Opitz's mother went to their vehicle. Even though some parcels and a bag of pretzels were on top of the trunk, Opitz had vanished without explanation. Believe it or not, another young woman would vanish from the same parking lot less than 1 month later. On February 11th, 18-year-old Mary Hare drove to the Edison Mall to pick up her mother, who happened to work at Woolworths. When Hare's mother exited the store after her shift, she found her daughter's unlocked vehicle parked outside. but hair was no way to be found four months later hair's decomposed body was found in lehigh acres she had been stabbed to death there were some striking similarities between the two victims who resembled each other opitz and hair both originally hailed from new york and attended the same high school however there was no indication that they actually knew each other one possible suspect is christopher wilder a serial killer who sexually assaulted and murdered over a dozen young women in Florida during the 1980s. However, Wilder was killed during a shootout with the police in 1984. So both of these cases continue to remain unsolved. Number 2, San Angelo John Doe. On March 31, 2005, an elderly man, possibly a transient, was browsing the Christians in the Action Thrift Store in San Angelo, Texas. when he suddenly collapsed he was rushed to the hospital and died shortly afterwards of what was probably a heart attack the cause of death was apparently so obvious and the death so unsurprising given the man's advanced age that no autopsy was performed but that's where the normal part of the story ends instead of carrying no id the man carried ids corresponding to four different identities herald freisinger roger s smith Gerald Brown and Peter Turner. He had also managed to damage the center of his finger pads to the point of deleting all their characteristics, effectively rendering him impossible to identify through a fingerprint match. Since fingerprint identification could not be made, this man was suspected of hiding some sort of criminal history. At one point, facial recognition experts believed that he might be the wanted Australian fugitive Elmer Crawford. who vanished after murdering his wife and three children in 1970 however dna testing ruled out this possibility until he can be identified the man will simply be known as san angelo's john doe number 3 chrissy wen on march 1st 1921 the body of 13 year old chrissy wen was found stuffed in a hollow tree stump near the village of north morton in tasmania Twisted tightly around her throat was a piece of hay baling wire about a foot in length. She also had a portion of the dress she'd been wearing that day stuffed down her throat, and this is believed to have caused her death by suffocation. Chrissy had disappeared on 20th February when she left her home on Allison Road to run errands in the village. After the discovery of her body, newspapers gave conflicting reports. They initially stated that Chrissy was murdered on February 21 and that her body was mutilated. Later the date was changed to February 26. It was reported that Chrissy had been strangled or suffocated and that her body only featured defensive wounds. People quickly pointed fingers at George William King, a 35-year-old former miner and a policeman. He was charged with the murder. King was seen in the area where Chrissy disappeared around the same time, and other people noted that he tried to speak to her whenever they met, even though the girl usually tried to dismiss him. King also had scratches and marks on his hands which he claimed that he sustained while participating in search party looking for Chrissy when she was still missing. When police searched King's home, they found an anonymous letter addressed to him. The author claimed to have seen King murder Chrissy and urged him to confess. The writer never came forward as a witness. At his trial, King was represented by Albert Ogilvy, future premier of Tasmania. Ogilvy secured a not guilty verdict by proving that the witnesses who gave circumstantial evidence against King weren't very reliable. Chrissy Wen's murder remains unsolved. Number 4, William Cantelow. 
This has to be one of history's weirdest stories. Back in the 1880s, William Cantelow, an engineer and a gun maker, was experimenting with a new type of a gun. Nobody knew what it was, but it produced shots in quick succession. It was clearly not your average rifle. One day, Cantelow announced to his sons, also engineers, that he had perfected his new invention. It was a machine gun, a weapon which used the energy of explosive recoil to load the next bullet. It would fire continuously until the bullets ran out. Then he packed his shiny new invention with the help of his two sons and went off, presumably to sell it. William Cantelo was never seen again. Cantelo's sons tirelessly searched for the missing inventor father. A private detective found evidence that Cantelo had gone to America and that a whole bunch of money had suddenly disappeared from his bank account, but never found any other clues as to what happened to him. However, it appeared that the mystery was solved soon after. An inventor who was identical in every way, named Hiram Maxim, had hit the scene in America selling his Maxim gun, basically a mounted machine gun that was more efficient than previous versions, but came at a high cost. Also, the gun happened to be the exact same design as William Cantelo's. It was obvious what happened. Cantelo had decided he didn't want to share his upcoming riches with his family so just rebranded himself under the clearly fake name Maxim. The scam was blown when Cantelo's son spotted Hiram Maxim's picture in a local newspaper and noticed that he looked like he could be their missing father's elderly stunt double. The man had come back to England and the sons confronted Maxim at a train station. It wasn't their father. Maxim could prove that he had been born and raised in the United States via census records and church registrars. He just so happens to look like Cantelo, just so happens to have invented the exact same thing at the same time, and just so happens to have started selling his gun at the same moment the inventor of the rival device disappeared into thin air. It should also be noted that Maxim had been to Southampton before, to meet with a different inventor, who accused him of stealing ideas. So did Maxim buy Cantelo's invention, then stomp him like a campfire to patent the gun as his own? Or was it just a case of parallel thinking and impossible coincidence? Now just to add another layer to the weirdness, Maxim complained in his autobiography that he had a double going around the US pretending to be him, the exact thing Cantelo's kids accused him of doing. Everyone involved in this mystery is dead, so it will probably never be solved. Number 5. Jean Spangler Jean Spangler would have made it really big, but she never got the chance. On October 7, 1949, Jean Spangler seemingly vanished off the face of the earth. Spangler seemed to lead a charmed life. In 1942, she married industrialist Dexter Benner, but the union didn't last. They divorced in 1946, and a bitter custody battle for daughter Christine ensued. Spangler won. One October day in 1949, she set off to meet her ex-husband about child support. On the way, she popped into a local store. The clerk distinctly remembered seeing her, and then no one else ever did, except maybe her killer, if she was actually murdered. The truth is, no one really knows. When she hadn't returned home by the following day, her sister-in-law contacted the police. Two days later, police found Spangler's purse near the Ferndale entrance to the Griffith Park. Both straps were torn, as if the bag had been ripped from a shoulder. There was no money in the purse, but there was a strange handwritten note. It read, Kirk, can't wait any longer. Going to see Dr. Scott. It will work best this way, while mother is away. Nobody knew who Kirk was. Fresh tips and leads were pouring in every day, but none of them led anywhere. Her former husband and just about everyone who knew her were cleared of all suspicion. More baffling, no one could identify who Dr. Scott was either. Publicity brought plenty of new tips and leads, each turning out to be completely useless. The only potential clue was that Spangler had worked on a movie with Kirk Douglas. Douglas managed to become entangled in the case by going out of his way to tell everyone that the Kirk in the note wasn't him. He barely knew her. Curiously, up until then, the police hadn't even really thought of him as a suspect, despite at the time checking out pretty much every Kirk and Scott within their jurisdiction, just in case. Douglas, of course, could be just covering his back and his involvement was just one of many odd little facts that kept popping up. For instance, three weeks before Spangler's disappearance, 
a shady abortion doctor named Dr. Kirk had been threatening all his former patients over the phone, and a close associate of his actually disappeared without a trace. But no evidence ever turned up connecting him with Spangler's disappearance. In yet another lead, two mobsters who had been partying with Spangler had also vanished around the same time, but there wasn't any evidence of them being involved either. In fact, no definitive theory or suspect were ever named. Eventually, the case faded from the front pages, and Gene Spangler's name faded from the public's consciousness. For Spangler's family, however, the nightmare continues. After her disappearance, the custody of Christine was transferred back to her father, who refused to let her grandmother see her. Another acrimonious court battle began. When the judge granted Florence Spangler visitation rights, Benner fled the state taking Christine with him. They were never seen again. A year after her disappearance, someone claimed that they had seen Spangler in Texas. Although they were sure it was her, she couldn't be traced. To this day, the disappearance of Jean Spangler remains unsolved. Number 6. The Potomsky Crater In 1949, geologist Vadim Kalpakov set off on an expedition to Siberia. Not realizing that he was about to discover one of the strangest unsolved mysteries in the world, the Potomsky Crater. As Kalpakov traveled deep into the almost uncharted territory, the local Yakut people warned him not to go on, explaining that there was an evil place deep in the woods that even the animals avoided. They called it the Fire Eagle Nest and claimed that people would start to feel unwell near it and some would simply disappear without a trace. A man of science, Kolpakov was not put off by these stories, but even he was at a loss to explain what he found deep in the Siberian forest. He discovered a large cone of limestone in the north of the Urkusk region in southeastern Siberia, about 360 kilometers from the district center Bodigo. The cone is curiously shaped with a crater at the top and a small mound in the center. The crater is the size of a 20-story building. It is about 40 meters high and 100 meters across the base. The smaller mound at the top is about 12 meters high. The crater was named Potomsky after a nearby river. Up close, it resembled a volcano mouth, but Kolpakov knew that there had been no volcanoes in the area for at least few million years. This crater looked relatively newly formed. Kolpakov estimated it as around 250 years old, a figure supported by later studies of nearby tree growth. Since the discovery of the crater, there have been many theories as to what could have created it. For a long time, it was believed to be a meteorite impact structure. Some linked it to the Tunguska meteorite, whose remains have never been discovered. But the crater does not resemble any other known meteorite site. Later, some geologists suggested that it could be a nascent volcano. But no volcanic material has ever been found either. Interestingly, the trees around the crater show evidence of accelerated growth for a period, similar to that seen in the forests around Chernobyl after the nuclear disaster. This has given rise to wild theories of hidden nuclear plant and buried UFO with nuclear fuel on board. So far, no object like the fragments of an asteroid or any metal under the crater has been discovered. In 2005, an expedition was launched in the hopes of finding some answers. But then, a tragedy struck. The leader of the expedition died of a heart attack just a few kilometers away from the site. The locals were convinced that it was the evil crater that led to his death. Number 7. The Disappearance of Brandon Swanson 19-year-old Brandon Swanson lived in Marshall, Minnesota with his parents. On the night of 14 May 2008, after celebrating the last day of college classes with a friend, he was driving home along a gravel road and somehow crashed his car into a ditch. Unable to move it himself and get back on the road, he called home at some time after midnight and asked his parents to pick him up near Lent, a small town southwest of Marshall. His parents left the house and began driving to pick up Brandon, at the same time speaking with him on his mobile phone to determine exactly where he was. After getting to the location which he had described, they started flashing the car's headlights so that Brandon could start walking towards them. Brandon told them that he could not see the lights at all, so he got back into his car and started flashing his own headlights in the hopes that maybe they would see him. His parents said that they couldn't see anything either. Both sides got increasingly frustrated, and Brandon eventually said that he was going to start walking towards the town of Lind to a friend's house. He said that he knew which direction to head in, 
as he could see what looked like the lights of a town. His father dropped Brandon's mother back at home, then began driving again to find his son. At around 2 a.m., Brandon and his father were on the phone to each other. 47 minutes into the phone call, Brandon suddenly exclaimed, Oh shit! And the line went dead. And that was the last time anybody heard anything from Brandon Swanson. His father tried calling back a number of times, but Brandon never picked up his phone. His frantic parents continued to search but were unable to find him. A few hours later, at around 6.30 am, they notified the police. The police were able to locate his vehicle by using cell phone records. In a strange turn of events, he wasn't even remotely close to Lind, where he initially believed. In fact, he was 20 miles away north of his suggested destination. Since Brandon was confused on his whereabouts, the most prevalent theory was that during his walk, he accidentally fell into the Yellow Medicine River that was close by. At the time, the water was at its deepest level it could reach, and was also flowing quite rapidly. Nevertheless, throughout the numerous searches conducted for Brandon, which included more than 500 volunteers and aerial views by airplanes and helicopters, nothing has been unearthed that would provide any substantial clues on Brandon's disappearance. The authorities say that there is neither any evidence of foul play nor any evidence that Brandon would have staged his own disappearance. The authorities received over 75 tips about Brandon, but none have borne any information that has led anywhere near to finding him. The last official search was conducted in October 2011, and age progress photos have been distributed in the hope that somebody may recognize him. Number 8. The Toynbee Tiles In 1992, a man in Philadelphia by the name of Bill O'Neill started noticing strange tiles randomly embedded in the local roads. They were generally about the size of a license plate, and each had some variation of the same strange message. Toynbee idea in Kubrick's 2001, Resurrect Dead on Planet Jupiter. They varied a bit in color and arrangement, but they were all made of an unidentifiable hard substance, and many had footnotes as strange as the message itself, such as, Murder every journalist, I beg you, and Submit Obey. Some were accompanied by lengthy paranoid diatribes about the news media, Jews and the Mafia. The titles all mention Toynbee, most likely Arnold J. Toynbee, a religious historian born in England in 1889. Some of the titles mention Kubrick, the filmmaker responsible for 2001 A Space Odyssey, which depicts a mission to Jupiter that ends in a famously trippy sequence. The astronaut watching himself in his deathbed and then suddenly, reborn as the star child. There is only one known intersection between the works of Toynbee and Kubrick, and it's pretty circumstantial. Toynbee's writing spoke of a man named Zoroaster who conceived the idea of monotheism, and this name also occurs in the title of the famous 2001 A Space Odyssey theme song. It's entitled, Thus Spoke Zoroaster. Other than that, the only thing setting these abnormally permanent acts of vandalism apart is that they have been showing out of nowhere, with no explanation for more than 30 years. And what's more, it isn't just a local phenomenon. Similar tiles have appeared in many US cities, including Washington DC, Pittsburgh, New York City, Baltimore, Boston, and many more. Some have even shown up in South America, in Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. To date, about 130 tiles have been discovered. Someone has managed to embed these tiles into public roads some of which are busy 24-7 without being spotted. Due to strong similarity in craftsmanship and writing style, these styles are most likely the work of a single individual. And given the diverse locales where the tiles can be found, he has the means and money to travel. The most tantalizing clue as to the source of these styles was in 1983 newspaper interview with a social worker from Philadelphia, a man named James Morosco who claimed that Jupiter could be colonized by bringing Earth's dead people there to have them resurrected. However, despite an interest in Toynbee and Kubrick, his widow swore up and down he couldn't possibly be the Tyler, and that he did not have an interest in Jupiter. But given the strong ties and strange circumstances, some believe that Morosco was the responsible party. But there are some problems with Morosco's theory. He would have been in his 70s when most of the tiles were placed and some new ones have been installed since his death in 2003. There are over 16 Philadelphia, 
which seems to be the Toyn B tile hotspot. Despite finding few links and background information, the purpose and message of these tiles remains inexplicable. Number 9. Jonathan Luna Back in 2003, 38-year-old Jonathan Luna, a married father of two, was working as an assistant US attorney in Baltimore, Maryland. On the night of December 3rd, he stayed late at the office, which was normal for him, and got into his car at 11.38 pm to drive back to his house, also in Baltimore. The next morning, his body was found stabbed an absurd number of times and dumped in a stream in Pennsylvania. Even stranger than suddenly getting murdered was Luna's behavior after leaving the office the night of his death. For one thing, rather than heading home, he drove to Delaware, where he withdrew $200 from an ATM. Then, for reasons that can never be explained, he drove to Pennsylvania. Along the way, he crossed a toll road. His ticket had blood on it, suggesting that he was already being attacked but still determined to complete whatever mission he was on. Luna's body was discovered in Pennsylvania stream, and although he had been stabbed 36 times and his throat was cut, his ultimate cause of death was drowning. None of the cash that Luna withdrew from the Delaware ATM was stolen. In fact, it was scattered around his car, as though whoever killed him rooted through his vehicle looking for something else. His blood was all over the backseat, suggesting that most if not all of the stabbing occurred there and the car's engine was still running when his body was discovered. Also, Luna had apparently been in a huge hurry to jump state lines, because he left his office in such a rush that he forgot his glasses on his desk. No suspects or motive for murder were determined. The FBI leaned towards calling it a suicide and came to the conclusion that he was alone from the time he left his office until his body was found. But the local Lancaster County authorities, including two successive coroners, ruled it a homicide. Additional evidence collected during the investigation captured a second blood type and a partial print as well as some grainy footage from near the time of the gas station purchase made with Luna's credit card at the Sunoco service plaza. The investigation remains ongoing. There is an unclaimed federal reward of $100,000 for information leading to a conviction. Number 10. Evelyn Grace Hartley on October 24, 1953, Evelyn Hartley was babysitting the toddler daughter of university professor Vigo Rasmussen in La Crosse, Wisconsin. The Rasmussens as well as their usual babysitter were attending the town homecoming game, so Evelyn filled in. Evelyn's father became concerned when she didn't call at 8.30 pm to check in as she was supposed to, and calls to the Rasmussen home went unanswered. Her father waited until 9.20 pm before driving to Rasmussen's house to check on his daughter. When he arrived, he could see the lights on in the house and hear the radio playing. He realized the door was locked and no one was answering his knocks. He peeked in the front window and saw his daughter's shoe and broken glasses on the floor, as well as her homework spread out across the room. He circled the house, trying windows. When he reached the back of the house, he saw the screen for the back window had been popped out and was lying on the grass. He looked in the window and saw his daughter's other shoe lying on the floor. He entered the house through the window and ran upstairs and searched for his daughter. The baby was sleeping in her crib, but Evelyn was nowhere to be found. One of the neighbors had seen Dr. Hartley pull up to the house, look around and the neighbor headed over to investigate. At this point, Dr. Hartley had left the house and was searching around it for signs of his daughter. The neighbor helped him briefly before returning to the house and calling the police. The police found a pool of blood just inside the basement window and a trail of blood leading away from the house to another pool of blood along with a bloody handprint on a neighbor's garage 100 feet from the Rasmussen's house. It was later to be confirmed as Evelyn's blood type. Scent dogs were brought in and followed Evelyn's scent for about two blocks before stopping. This led police to believe that she was then put in a car and taken away. After neighbors realized there had been an alleged kidnapping, they came forward with information. One couple had heard two or three high-pitched screams that night at approximately 7 pm. They both agreed that they did not sound normal, but thought it was a child or a rowdy game-goer. An unfamiliar light-colored car was seen circling the neighborhood that evening, until approximately 8 pm. 
a local man came forward two days after the disappearance that at 7.15 p.m. that night, he saw a two-toned green Buick speeding westward. One male was in the front seat driving, while the other male was in the back seat along with a girl who was slumped over. A few days later, two miles south of La Crosse, a pair of bloody panties and a brassiere were found. Four miles further up the road, a pair of men's pants stained with blood were also found. It is suspected they were part of Evelyn's disappearance, but no evidence was found linking them. Her parents did confirm that the underwear were the same size that Evelyn wore. Southeast of La Crosse, a pair of men's size 11 shoes were found, along with a denim jacket. Both were stained with blood, later confirmed to be Evelyn's blood type. The shoes also were a close match to a shoe print found near the basement window of the Rasmussen home. A short time later, the Hartleys received two phone calls in which a man offered to trade information about Evelyn for $500 cash. Police assisted the Hartleys in setting up a trap for the caller. The snare was a success and resulted in the capture of a 20-year-old man named Jack Dufferin. As it happened, Dufferin knew nothing about Evelyn. He was convicted and imprisoned for attempted extortion. The investigation was carried out for years, with no further leads. They showed the jacket to an estimated 10,000 people, with no one recognizing it. To take matters further, authorities announced that all cars would be checked. The goal was to have the backseat and trunk of every car in the county inspected for bloodstains or any other suspicious signs. 40,000 stickers were printed, each reading My Car Is OK. Authorities would place a sticker on every car that had been checked and cleared. They gave polygraphs to all students and teachers in her school. None of this yielded any results. Their only suspect was a notorious killer, Ed Gein, who happened to be in lacrosse on October 24th visiting a family. However, no evidence was ever found linking him to the crime, and he denied being involved. To this day, Evelyn's disappearance remains unsolved.